Grunta, Lord of Tarantasha, and very briefly, Great King of the Hittite Empire, is one of the few figures in Total War of Pharaoh who had very little interaction with the Bronze Age Collapse, at least as far as we know. But at the same time, his origins lie in the failure of legitimacy for the Hittite royal line leading up to the Collapse, and the implications of the state that he built would survive far longer than any of the other Bronze Age dynasts, being in many ways the first of the Neo-Hittite rulers. Seventy years prior to the start of Total War Pharaoh, up in the region of Anatolia, the great king of the Hittite Empire, Muatali II, had died. This king had two sons, Olmi Teshub and Urhi Teshub. Prior to the king's death, the younger son, Olmi Teshub, had been sent to live on the frontiers of the empire with his uncle Hattushili, a way of both educating the young man under the greatest Hittite commander of the generation, and also of keeping him out of the capital to allow his older son, Urhi Teshub, a clean inheritance. As it so happened, the older son, Urhi Teshub, ruled only a few years before a falling out with Uncle Hattushili saw the realm split in civil war. The younger son, Olmi Teshub, likely too young to be a candidate for the throne in his own right, backed his uncle Hattushili, which ended up being the winning side. As a reward for his loyalty, as a recognition of his young vigor and competence, and in order to keep him out of the capital, Hattushili made Olmi Teshub into the royal viceroy of the city of Tarantasha in southern Anatolia. A royal viceroy was a special position in the Hittite Empire. Among many, many mere vassals, only two other royal viceroys existed both from branches of the royal family, and both allowed autonomy and supremacy over the other vassals. These other two ruled over the Syrian cities of Aleppo, which was one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, and the city of Carchemish on the Euphrates River right at the modern Syrian-Turkish border. But Olmi Teshub's status as viceroy was even greater than the two Syrian viceroys, since he was given near-complete autonomy and dominion over all of southwest Anatolia, much the way his uncle Hattushili had previously been made near-autonomous governor over the entire northern border in the previous generation. Of course, there was one catch to this incredibly distinguished, honored, wealthy, and powerful position. It was that most of southwest Anatolia, the region he nominally commanded beyond the walls of Tarantasha, had fallen to rebels, bandits, and invaders. He would be allowed to rule his own personal kingdom however he saw fit, but in true Hittite fashion, he'd have to earn it first. And as a young man so recently tutored by the best the empire had to offer, he had the youth, vigor, and determination to seize the opportunity he'd been given. The Hittite Empire was hugely diverse, and the southern region was dominated by people of the Luwian language and cultural groups, and so Olmi Teshub adopted a throne name familiar to his new people, Kurunta, a god of the hunt whose icon is the stag. He placed his own people in local power centers, conquered the regions closest to the city, and generally settled in for what would prove to be a life dominated by conquest. In one sense, most of the towns and valleys of southwest Anatolia had once been properly part of the Hittite Empire, and so those mayors and petty lords were all technically rebels. And even now, some of them still took that rebellion quite seriously, but most were simply unattached from an empire too busy to support and protect them. The main threats in the region were the Lucan people, another group of Anatolians who had become hyper-aggressive on land in the last century for unclear reasons, and whose settled coastal towns had developed at the same time a reputation as pirate havens, as well as raiding war bands of Mycenaean Greeks, arriving at first like Vikings, 
and later like desperate refugees as their own land saw the first previews of the Bronze Age collapse. We know very little about the progress of Corinthus' campaigns in the southwest. We know he built a nice little spot for himself, and we also know that he was never fully successful in pacifying the west, despite being at it a very long time. His lands were not rich in wealth or manpower, but his army is clearly making the most of the Hittite shock units, regularly deployed in night attacks and ambushes, and being able to concentrate his forces in a relatively local region gives him an advantage over the empire as a whole, which has to spread over all its multiple frontiers. It isn't clear at what point he comes to realize that he has this advantage, but at some point during the reign of his cousin, Tudhalia IV, father of Shibililiuma, he starts to think that he could take the wider empire in a fight. And he remembers that he does have a claim to the throne via his father, Muatali. Over in Hattusha, capital of the empire, Tudhalia is overstretched. He's fighting on multiple fronts. At the same time, he's suffering from legitimacy issues the legacy of his father's usurpation of the throne. And his mother, Pudahepa, is busy reforming the Hittite religion, something which is proving deeply unpopular in many quarters. Smelling weakness, Kurunta declares himself great king and marches on Hattusha, while Tudhalia and the army are away on campaign. Now, unfortunately, that smell of weakness was not actually as strong as Corunta had thought. And as soon as Tithalia returns from campaign, he kicks his cousin all the way back to Tarhantasha. Now, if you read older accounts, it used to be believed that Tithalia actually died in this campaign and Corunta was defeated by Tithalia's son, Arnawanda. But it's now increasingly clear that Tithalia did survive at least a few years following this civil war and that Arnawanda accomplished basically nothing before dying. Anyway, Kurunta may have been forced back into his territory, but the breach between Tarhantasha and the Hittite Empire was now official. As we enter into the time period of Total War Pharaoh around 1205 BCE, hostilities are simmering as an increasingly old Kurunta eyes a youthful Shipililiuma beset by crisis after crisis. A friendly start soon deteriorates, however, and the two wage a brief and inconclusive war about which little is known. We don't know how or when Kurunta dies, but surely right around the time Shipililiuma is facing his end, Kurunta is as well. However, Corinta's demise is age-related, and unlike the wider Hittite Empire, Tarhuntasha does not collapse. It does, like most of the region, descend into obscurity for the next good while, likely surviving some extremely hard times, but what comes out at the other end of the Hittite collapse is a situation usually called the Neo-Hittite States. Of course, they didn't call it in their own time, they were just Hittites in their own time, and of course in the Bible that's what they survive as being called as, but we call them the Hittite states because they are pretty different. Now we can't say much for sure about how that transition happened in Tarhantasha, but it used to be believed that a fellow named Hartapu, son of Mershili, who claimed the traditional title of great king, ruled in the region around Tarhantasha and adopted many Hittite affectations, and he was either thought to be Kurunta's grandson or his nephew. However, just in the past few years, a document was found from King Hartapu describing his involvement in a war against King Midas and the Phrygians around the 8th century, some four centuries later. And this right here illustrates the Neo-Hittites better than anything else. You see, right around the time that all the surviving vassals and subjects of Shipililiuma realize that the king is missing and the capital has been sacked, we see the chief viceroys in the south all start to claim the title of great king, reasoning that they're each related to the royal family somehow. 
However, given the chaos of the time, none of them really make much headway, or perhaps they don't even really attempt to adopt all the imperial responsibilities of that title. They just sort of claim it, and adopt some of the bureaucratic and propaganda styles of the old empire. Pretty soon, many other former Hittite towns, some of which were little more than villages, decide that they too can be great kings or at least adopt imperial stylings for the sake of their ego, and is a callback to the better times when the Bronze Age wasn't collapsing. You see, Hittite has always meant very little in terms of language or culture. I'm glossing over a lot here, but it's always been a very multi-ethnic and often ethnically shifting empire. By now, it's more likely to officially communicate in Luwian than the original Neshite language of the empire's founding. To be a Hittite, or more accurately, to be a subject of the Hittites, since they would never really call themselves Hittites, it really means little more than being a subject of someone who rules and fights in the Hittite style. Soon enough, we have Hittite towns without any Hittites in them. And on the other hand, we also soon see Aramean towns as they invade into the region. We see those towns full of Hittite subjects. We see towns that are half Aramean, half Hittite. We see Luwian Hittites, Hurrian Hittites, Syrian Hittites, Canaanite Hittites, Semitic Hittites. We even see mercenary Hittites among the biblical Israelites and more varieties than we can track. And what it means to be Hittite changes from place to place. And this is how a man like Hartapu can be so hard to trace across four centuries. There's so many Hittite signifiers thrown in at random in these Neo-Hittite statelets that the designation becomes something close to arbitrary in some cases. It's almost like it's just a self-designation, not always a self-designation. Sometimes it's based on the city, sometimes it's based on tradition, but it's based on so many different possible things. But without getting too deep into the chaos that is the Neo-Hittites, Kurunta is the first of them. He is the first to claim the title of Great King without ever really being in a position to take over the Empire. He rules a diverse and relatively small kingdom, picking and choosing from among local customs and Hittite methods, whichever best suits him at the moment. And while we haven't seen him shown off in the previews yet, the hope is that this can be well represented in Total War Pharaoh. We do know that we've, we've seen that he's going to look like an old man with the stag horns of his eponymous god upon his head, and it's pretty sure that he'll start in Tarhantasha, a city whose exact location is unknown, but was somewhere within a hundred mile radius of modern Mersin, Turkey. His campaign should be all about unit diversity, with the full spectrum of Anatolia, Hurrian, Syrian, and Semitic units available, either at the start or just relatively nearby. He's in a position to potentially transform the boast of Great King into a renewed Hittite empire, but far more interestingly, for those more interested in a historical playthrough, He's in a place to simply allow the Hittite Empire to collapse, and then rebuild it in whatever shape or concentration he desires, maybe making the move into a naval power along the Anatolian, Cypriot, and Phoenician coasts once the threat of the Sea Peoples has diminished, or perhaps to move over towards the Greeks and change history forever. The possibilities for Kurunta, in the hands of a player who manages to tank whatever the era throws at him, are pretty much endless. But what has ended is our series on the major faction leaders of Total War Pharaoh. I'm going to take a little while, maybe a few weeks, to focus on some other things, but make sure you've subscribed to this channel, because soon enough I'll be putting together and releasing some more 
more topical videos designed to deepen your sense of the period's lore and help you as a player to motivate your decisions for reasons beyond tactical necessity and gameplay effects. I mean like, we're gonna look at religion and the gods in a bid to make you pick gods for lore and flavor reasons regardless of whatever modifiers they offer. We'll be looking at how war was actually waged in the late Bronze Age as well as we can tell, which may or may not have direct applications to a Total War game, because of course the violence mechanics in that game are a bit different from history just in and of themselves. But most importantly, we're going to go deep into any questions you might have, so definitely drop comments, questions, or thoughts about the era or the game into the comments below any of these videos, and expect to see a steady stream of content as the October release date approaches. But until then, we bid farewell to Olmi Teshem, my son, great king, Tabarn, mighty hero, Grunta, son of Muatam. Thank you for watching.